Well, hi, in this talk we're going to be considering another Bible hero, and that's Barnabas. Now, Barnabas was born and grew up on the Greek-speaking island of Cyprus. He was a Jew, he was from a priestly tribe, the priestly tribe of Levi, and his family seemed quite wealthy. There are hints in some writings that they sent Barnabas to Jerusalem to study under the tutor Gamaliel, whose Hillel school was famous for its balanced education as, as well as studying Judaism. They also covered classic literature, philosophy, particularly Stoic philosophy. Languages were covered, ethics. And it was the very same teacher in the very same school that Paul the Apostle attended. Indeed, in Easton's uh, Bible Dictionary, Easton believes that Barnabas and Paul probably knew each other because they'd been taught together in the school of Gamaliel. Well, whatever the case, at some time, Barnabas moved back to the land of his descendants, Israel, from Cyprus. And it was here that he came across the man that he eventually or soon accepted as his Messiah. And though he was not one of the twelve, there are hints that to suggest he was certainly one of the 72 disciples of Jesus. His name wasn't Barnabas, but was Joseph. Now he was clearly loved by the believers and obviously a great encouragement to them, so the apostles eventually nicknamed him Son of Encouragement. And in Hebrew that means Bar Nabas, Bar, Son, and Nabas, Encouragement, Son of Encouragement. He was a great encourager. And so in Acts 4 we're told that Joseph was also named Barnabas, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Having land, he sold it and he brought the money for the common good of the people. Well, soon after this, things got a little bit tough for the believers because of the persecutions of Shaul or Saul of Tarsus. But Barnabas survived the murders and the imprisonments and the tortures of that time. And that same Saul, soon to be known as Paul, of course, would come to believe in Barnabas' Messiah also. Now, after his conversion, Paul disappeared into Arabia to spend time in the scriptures, putting together all the pieces, uncovering the enormity of the truth of his newfound saviour. And after three years, he returned. First he went to Damascus, and there we're told that he went to the synagogue to preach and he f the, the, this newfound truth. And it says that he confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, and he proved to them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Well, many didn't like what Paul had to say at that time, so they tried to kill him, and he was let down the wall in a big basket, and he escaped. And he returned then to his hometown of Tarsus. But after that, he headed for Jerusalem, but the believers there were very afraid, refused to believe that he was now a disciple of Jesus. And it was our man Barnabas that spoke for Paul, explaining all that had happened to him and how he had spoken so boldly at Damascus and how so many had come to faith through Paul. Well, Paul stayed in Jerusalem for some time, and again there were plots by the Greek Jews to kill him, so the apostles sent him back to his hometown of Tarsus. And we next hear of Barnabas soon after this. The apostles had started to hear about many coming to the faith in the city of Antioch. The people of Antioch were receiving the message and the gospel from evangelists that had come over from Cyprus. Now, Antioch was the third largest city of the empire behind Rome and Alexandria, and it had a population of around about half a million. It had a very large Jewish sector in the region of the city called Keratean, and years later the number of believers in Antioch would grow to around 10,000. Huge. Well, the apostles were keen to help these new believers, and so who better to send than Barnabas, a Cypriot, a learned and a faithful leader? And Luke describes Barnabas in these words. He says, When Barnabas had arrived in Jerusalem, he was full of the grace of God. He was full of gladness and encouraged them all with the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord through him. 
And in fact, he's the only person after the Gospels to be called good in our Bible. And so off he went to Antioch, and he was thrilled with what he found there. Many new believers, but they were lacking in teaching and lacking in instruction. And so Barnabas had an idea. He set off north to Tarsus to seek out his old friend Paul. And on finding him, he brought him to Antioch and they stayed for a whole year. And it says that they taught a great many people between them. And it was here at Antioch during this time that believers were nicknamed Christians by the pagans. And prior to this, they were known as the Way. Now, at the end of this year of teaching and encouragement and preaching, Paul and Barnabas travelled back to Jerusalem with money for the poor. And it was here in Jerusalem that Barnabas introduced Paul to his young nephew, John Mark. John Mark was a fervent follower of Jesus. Now, the word for nephew is anipsios, sometimes translated coven, but more accurately, nephew, particularly a sister's son. And the three of them travelled back to Antioch together. Now, amongst the believers in Antioch were a group of three senior chaps that Paul and Barnabas would meet with on a regular basis. And the Bible describes these men as prophets and teachers. Their names were Simeon, Lucius from Cyrene in North Africa, and another man who'd been brought up in the courts of King Herod's son. And his name was Manian. Well, the five of them, these three, plus Barnabas and Paul, were meeting together one day and fasting, and we're told that the Holy Spirit spoke clearly to them. Separate out Paul and Barnabas for the work which I have for them. And indeed, this is the only time in Acts where we hear of the Holy Spirit giving a direct command to a specific church. And so they did what they were told. They set apart Paul and Barnabas to preach the good news of Jesus as wide as God's Spirit would lead them. And so they set off, taking with them Barnabas' nephew, John Mark, as an assistant. Well, where better to start than Barnabas' home island of Cyprus? And sailing from the port of Seleucia, they arrived in Salamis and they immediately started preaching in the synagogues. Now eventually, after they'd preached across the entire island, they ended up in Paphos, just here on the island. And it was here that the highest ranking official of the island, the proconsul, who answered directly to the Roman Senate, asked to hear the word from Barnabas and Paul personally. And this man's name was Sergius Paulus. And he had an advisor, and the advisor's name was Elimas Bargesus or Elimas by Yeshua. He was a Jewish man and he was a sorcerer or a false prophet. And Elimas stood against Barnabas and Paul and he tried to stop the proconsul hearing the truth. And Paul rebuked him strongly and said, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And then the scripture says, immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And at this the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done. It says that he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. A wonderful story. Now I'd like to address quickly a misunderstanding. Do not think that Barnabas was just a sidekick to Paul. No, indeed he was the main influence at Antioch. It was him that brought Paul to the city. And his name is mentioned ahead of Paul's on numerous occasions. For example, we've just mentioned the proconsul on Cyprus who said that he wanted to hear the words of Barnabas and Saul. And the recorded words of the Holy Spirit at Antioch were set apart Barnabas and Saul or Barnabas and Paul. They were both extraordinary and complementary in their work for the Lord. Barnabas was not a junior apprentice to Paul. And together, Paul, Barnabas and John Mark went on to visit the major cities of Asia Minor or modern-day southern Turkey. They went to Pergamum. They went to Antioch, a different Antioch, Lystra, Iconium, Derby and Italia before they returned around two years later to Antioch. Now, sometime in the middle of this trip, John Mark decided to return home. We don't know why, whether it was illness, health, fear personality clash we we just don't know but we'll come back to that 
One interesting story occurred in the town of Lystra that they visit. A lame man had been listening to the preaching of Barnabas and Paul, and it says that Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and he called out, Stand up on your feet! And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. And when the crowd saw what had been done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes. Now, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, then brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and they rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. But even with these words, it says, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. We're then told that some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over and they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking that he was dead. But we're told that after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and he went back into the city. Very brave thing to do. But the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Interestingly, to the ancient Greeks, Zeus was a primary god, considered the god of sky and the god of thunder, the ruler of all other gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus. And that's what they called Barnabas, Zeus. It would have been a recognition of his leadership and his authority and his stature, his gravitas. Now, quite a lot happens after they return from this journey. Barnabas and Paul had been making believers of both Jews and Gentiles. And as a result, there was a debate. And it says that certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul says this matter arose because some false teachers had infiltrated their ranks to spy on the freedom that they had in Christ Jesus and to make them slaves. And interestingly, it was now that Barnabas made an error of judgment. And whilst these Jews were visiting, he and the visiting apostle Peter stopped eating with the Gentiles as they feared, as Barnabas feared, what those who were of the circumcision would think. And Paul had some strong words to say about this, and both of them corrected their error. But at some point, an important meeting was arranged. It's known today as the Council of Jerusalem, and it was all about circumcision. Paul maintained that the Gentiles were saved by faith alone and that there was no requirement for circumcision. Indeed, this was wholeheartedly accepted by Barnabas and by Peter. Certain other Jews were getting into the church and declaring that circumcision was central to being saved. And so Barnabas and Paul, together with two others, Silas and a man called Judas Barsabbas, travelled to Jerusalem to agree together what was necessary for the Gentiles to be saved. And then it says, All the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them amongst the Gentiles. And then it says, After they became silent, James got up. Now, James was the half-brother of Jesus, known as James the Just. And he quoted the prophets and he declared that the Gentiles were not to be put under the law of circumcision. And indeed, he wrote a letter to that effect for Barnabas and Paul to take back to the churches. And the letter apologised for the disturbance created by the legalists. It discredited them and it affirmed the integrity of Barnabas and Paul. And it explained also why Judas and Silas had come to Antioch. And it asked the Gentile Christians to avoid several behaviours that may be offensive to Jewish believers. And the whole of this letter can be read in Acts 15. And so the matter was settled. Now it's interesting, where Paul was an amazing mind and extraordinary intellect, Barnabas 
had the warmth and the ability to win people over. In the words of Luke, he was full of grace, full of gladness and full of encouragement. And that means they were a great team. However, soon after this, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns that we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Well, Barnabas was keen to take John Mark, his nephew, with them again. And Paul said, I don't think it would be wise as he deserted us last time. And they had quite a, an interesting or sharp argument about this issue. And I love the Bible for its honesty. It tells us as it happened. And in the end, they decided not to travel together. Instead, Barnabas and John Mark set off for Cyprus together. And uh, Paul and Silas set off to revisit the towns of Asia Minor. Well, what we do know for sure is that it all ended well. Things got patched up and John Mark came to mean so much to Paul that during a time of great trouble in Paul's life, he said, bring Mark to me because he's become such a help to me in my ministry. He called for him. Another thing that we can see from scripture that sets Barnabas and Paul aside is this. They chose, as a rule, not to accept financial support from the churches, even though this would have been totally reasonable and expected. Instead, they chose to work to earn a living rather than be a burden to the church. Well, that's a lesson that many wealthy churches and evangelists would do well to consider today, is it not? We don't know for sure how Barnabas died. Tradition passed down through the generations can have an element of truth, and that's all we have for Barnabas. And this tells us in works written a few hundred years after his death that he was martyred in Cyprus, that he was despised because of his success in spreading the gospel, and that while he was debating Jesus in the synagogue at Salamis, he was dragged into the street. He was tortured terribly and stoned to death. Some say that his nephew John Mark witnessed this and arranged for his burial, but we really don't know any detail. It matters not. We know that he did die a martyr's death. This man who had means, he had money, he had property, but he gave it all up for the sake of his Messiah. Very similar to his nephew John Mark. John Mark was an extraordinary man. And you can hear more about that in a, another talk. I'll leave a link at the top here. But John Mark came from a family with considerable wealth, as did Barnabas. And these two could have chosen an easy life, a well-off, a comfortable life. They were set up, but they chose to put Christ before all of that, never settling down and enjoying their earthly inheritances. Indeed, they put it all at risk to set up treasures in heaven. They were more interested in pleasing God and serving Jesus than protecting their birthright and their wealth. And that would, they knew, only turn into rust. Not interested in wealth that would last just a fleeting moment. This was so true, actually, of many of the early disciples. And to me, it validates the scripture. If Jesus had not risen... If he had not appeared personally to these people, and we're told that he did appear to the wide 120 and more, then this would never have happened. Our hero Barnabas, together with Mark and many other of the disciples, would not have given up their wealth, their health, their lives for what they knew to be a lie. They would not do that. Why would you do that? Why would you be prepared to die a horrible and painful death for a fraud? But they knew it was true and they were prepared to give up everything for the truth of their Messiah. They found the pearl of great price and they do anything for it or anything to keep it. And I love Barnabas for that. He had no concern for himself, no concern for his reputation, no concern for his brand or his standing. And I'm also reminded how this world and the church needs the sons and the daughters of encouragement. The Bible talks about this particular gift and how important it is to us. Barnabas was able to unlock doors, unlock situations, unlock people with his ability to encourage them. Let's be really careful not to despise the much needed gift of God of encouragement. Let's nurture it. God bless.